Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Ian, uh, Nadim, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, Hi. it's uh, our hangout really to have a little bit more of a conversation around the Network Barometer Report as it relates to mobility and the Internet of Things, uh, user centricity, and, uh, and how the network actually is used to connect all these dots. So for everybody joining, uh, if there are any questions popping up during the, the course of this afternoon, please post your questions with the, ha the hashtag DDHangouts, um, and we will actually get back to those questions as soon as we can. So guys, uh, you know, just to set the scene here, um, there's generally a consensus forming that the, um, the, con the future competitive advantage will really be created through data analytics. We're seeing this across the board. We're seeing it inside of our business as well. Um, business models will be shaped around cloud and really the ability for clients to actually um, procure in a, in, a, in a consumptive type model, um, as well as the engagement uh, with you know, the, the employees within organizations, but also across organizations will really be powered by mobility and, and social technologies. You know, so social media, mobility and the internet of things, the cloud, as well as uh, um, you know, a couple of other technologies that we're starting to see um, forming and taking hold within our business, but also in some of our clients' businesses, are really shaped around um, uh, you know cloud technologies and that being able to uh, to enhance the ability that we're actually taking applications to market uh, sooner and faster. Um, you know, I think the combination of stuff, the new tech trends, etc., is really affecting um, a lot of the. Uh, the way that we interact with our clients, but also the way that clients interact with their customers. Um, so, Ian, from your perspective, you know, how do you see these trends actually affecting us, um, and and how do you think that the user might be becoming a disruptive force uh, in this? Yeah, sure, Andre. So, so firstly, thanks for for inviting me along to the session today. I think you know, the, without a doubt, the user is redefining. Um, the enterprise world today in the same way as it has done in the last five years in the consumer world. You know, if we look at the consumer world right now that we've, we've seen as a result of, you know, digital disruption in the marketplace, you know, you, you have a situation that, you know, five years ago, would you imagine today that the largest hotel brand in the world, Airbnb, would not own a single hotel, that the largest land travel organization in the world, Uber, would not own a taxi? You know, the, the, the digital world has fundamentally changed the way in which organizations do business. And, you know, without a doubt, you know, Gartner are predicting right now that there isn't a single industry in the world within the next five years that will not be affected by digital transformation. So, so why is that? It's, it's really simple. It's, it's because of the user. You know, the user is, is today is informed. They've got access to information, and they've, they've got availability of the tools to, to execute on that access to information. And, and so we really are seeing a, a monumental shift, and I think, you know, then relating that back into businesses today, you know, aside from the customer experience and customer engagement side of their organization, they've also then got to look at also internally into their internal customer base. And what we're seeing today is a, is a really huge shift within organizations where, you know, IT used to be, if you like, soup to nuts, um, the bastion of everything from innovation right the way through to delivery. The reality is today, as a result of user trends um, and, and user um, uh, requirements, is IT can't possibly keep up with that demand. You know, the, there is far too much innovation, far too much change. And, you know, if you take it on a typical IT, you know, depreciation cycle or investment cycle of every five years, well, you know, on, on this five years ago, Uber and WhatsApp didn't exist. Yeah. Um, that, that's the reality today. In fact, five years ago, I think we were on the iPhone too, and that wasn't a business suitable uh, suitable tool for today's uh, technology either. So, so you look at that and you go, okay, well, what is, in reality is happening within organizations? The, the reality is, is that CEOs and CXOs of organizations recognize this trend. And what we're seeing is that IT budgets are consistent, or the, the, the role of IT is fundamentally changing. It's changing from an, an innovation through to the delivery house to being purely a delivery house in many organizations, yeah, focused heavily on um, driving uh, driving down costs, driving security, governance, and uh, reliability of service. That's fundamentally their role. Um, and and the, the flip side then is that there's far more onus actually on the line of business and the user community on how to transform their environment. You know, the, the, it's being termed bimodal IT strategies, mode one being the IT side, mode two being user and line of business driven. 
And you know, go back to your point there about cloud and analytics. I think I think it raises a really interesting point. You know, if you look at the most mature, if you like, mode two markets out there, I would say that the, probably the two most mature there in the world that we can learn from are actually um, ERP and CRM, um, two of the most mature markets in this space. So the big players in those spaces are SAP and uh, Salesforce.com. And, and you look at those marketplaces today, and, and what many CIOs did is made a conscious decision to say, no, okay, line of business, go out there, go, go, go crazy, you know, make your own decisions, and away you go. But you look back to where that is today, and 80%, 70 or 80% of the ERP and CRM market right now is not technology. It is how to integrate discrete procurement cycles in that space. So, you know, for instance, I, I know of one very major Fortune uh, 500 organization who's just laid off their CIO, or fired their CIO. Why? Because they, they let their organization go and purchase loads of different instances of ERP tools. As a result, they missed, uh, they couldn't consolidate quick enough, they missed their end of year financial results, quarterly financial results, deadlines to the market. Um, now, why? Because the, the CIO didn't bring that into mode one quick enough. Um, and as a result, to bring it into mode one quick enough was then lumped with a billion dollar bill. Yeah, so a, a billion dollars worth of unbudgeted IT budget. So, so how do we how do we correct that? How do we learn from a um, a collaboration angle on on how do we learn to change to buck that trend? Well, the the reality is that we need to make um, we need to ensure that that IT remain relevant to the line of business. And the key way that IT can remain relevant to the line of business is by driving all of the things that IT are fantastic at driving. As I said, cost reduction, governance, reliability, security, um, and also consistency of strategy across line of, lines of business. And the way that we do that is, is really a, a, couple of, a couple of areas. You know, the first is being able to predict change. This is, this is ultimately where analytics come in. You know? How do you ultimately identify the change in organizations? How do you identify the needs of you know, the, the, the organizational change? For instance, you know, through through analytics, how do you identify that, you know, 50,000 of your employees have now just downloaded a new app on their mobile phone? You know, that, that's pretty important, right? Because that's going to have fundamental changes to your network, the way you consume network resources, and um, and the way in which they communicate going forward. Especially, let's face it, if, it, if, if that app also means that you upload data, if it means that you communicate live on video calls, et cetera, et cetera, that's going to have a big change to your network. Um, so, so through that, analytics is a key tool. You know, if we look at, um, and I'm sure Nadim will, will touch on it, you know, the platform that we're building with our end-use computing platform where we can identify the changes on mobile devices that are coming through, that, that's a crucial thing. Identifying also change in user behavior and user patterns is a crucial thing for, for CIOs to identify. And then once you understand that, you can also map against what the spend is in those areas. And I think this is a crucial piece right now. You know, if we look at the more mature collaboration mode two markets, let's take audio conferencing, for instance. You know, if you go out to, to RFP today, you know, the typical, you'll typically get less than a cent a minute for your audio conferencing market. The, the reality is, is that 80% of the audio conference market today pays more than 30 cents a minute. Yeah, So 30 times plus overspend in that market. Why? Because Mode 2 um, went off and made specific opportunity cost decisions that were right in, in, in their isolation, but when put together in a, as an organizational whole didn't make sense. So I think, I think that is crucial, and I think this is the real digital dilemma organizations are in right now, is you know where we are bottoming out to right now is that IT budgets over the next year are predicted to fall by 30%. Line of business technology budgets are expected to increase by 85% over the next two years. And in fact, what we're expecting is a 50-50 split between technology budgets between line of business and IT. So there really is a key play now in the marketplace for the key tools that will make IT relevant to the line of business. And, and also from a CIO's perspective, how do you protect your budget? So how do you protect and de-risk your investment? And this is where, you know, the big change in the user market, you're never going to be able to fully predict this. You're never going to be master your own destiny like you were in the old days of solid state technology. You know, that, that market is moving too quickly. So how do you de-risk your profile? How do you make sure that you're de-risked from a, you know, you're, you're going to have huge scarcity of resource issues. You know, the explosion of device and applications mean that you're going to have a huge scarcity of resource issues. Your, your fundamental, you know, your five-year investment in solid state stuff three years ago, it's going to be out of date today. Yeah, that's, that's the reality. In fact, 
you know, there's no, there's no, there's no, um, uh, you know, guarantees that what you invested in 24 months ago will be relevant today, or even 12 months or even six months ago. So, so that what the big shift that we're seeing in the marketplace now, when people say move to cloud, and you know, we're all expecting this 50% move to a uh, 50% of technology budget to shift into the cloud in the next two years, is is really simple. It's it's really down to one thing: it's the transfer of organizational risk from IT onto vendor. You know, that's that's ultimately what we're seeing: a shift of risk, um, and and that shift of risk. Has a, has a massive change, and what, what we're seeing is in the next few years, not a whole set of shift to public cloud, because you still need those those security and governance, etc., um, fundamentals. But actually, how do I leverage today's investment but de-risk my risk profile? So, from our organizational perspective, we're seeing a big move towards um, dimension taking, dimension data taking, asset ownership of existing assets, and leveraging that with a cloud future, taking people on a hybrid cloud and managed service journey, which is basically showing that deferral of risk over time. So it's a, it's a massive shift in the marketplace, and I think I think that then provides a, a, a massive increase of agility and scalability in organizations. But as I said, the, the unpredictability is huge. And I think this isn't just from an application perspective, but it's also driven massively between the way that people meet in the workplace and the workspaces they use, which you know, I guess, Nadine, from your side, you're seeing a, a, a kind of monumental shift in that marketplace right now, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, um, and um, great stuff, Ian. I appreciate that um, kind of intro commentary, and, and Andre, you too, as well. Um, just pick it up on um, what you guys, I think, both talked about is we're certainly seeing a shift from uh, desktop computing to user-centric computing. You know, with mobility and consumerization IT, there's been a move to user-centric uh, computing for some time. And that's all about putting user at the center and allowing them, act, allowing them access to applications and data from any device at any location. And in this model, the organizations really must deal with all device types and manage the differing application needs or access rights to employees or of employees. Um, so clients are telling us that um, this model actually resonates with them because this is how their employees want to work. Um, and we're see, certainly seeing user preferences and user experience take a paramount role in uh, business decisions uh, and IT decisions. So um, really to enable the shift though, organizations really need to implement a workplace transformation strategy and something we at Dimension Data call workspaces for tomorrow. And a workspace for tomorrow is any location where business functions are performed. Um, the strategy really takes into account that the workplace is changing, uh, where people work and uh, where they perform their business function is changing. Uh, where and how people connect with each other is also changing. So every play, every workspace has different requirements. Uh, clients need to extend um, their end user technology uh, to, to the business process and in, as a result enable new business models. Um, so uh, we feel by uh, enabling these different workspaces productivity and agility are actually increased. Thanks for that. Yeah, that so I think yeah. uh, yeah, this is interesting because in both of the situations where we're looking at, at mobility and, and companies actually adopting you know, cloud-based platforms and also the, the move around uh, the mobile workspace, we were really talking around um, connected environments and connected experiences. You know, so the network actually becomes critical in order to support all of these technologies going forward. So I'd like to spend uh, just a few minutes on what it really means to be ready and having that network ready in order to support a mobile strategy or, a, or um, you know, workspaces for tomorrow, etc., um, and really enabling clients to use and to be able to work whenever they need to, wherever they need to, uh, in the most efficient way. And what we're seeing is that there is a shift. So if you look five years ago, typically when clients started deploying a, a new uh, a local area network, they would deploy it with a whole bunch of Ethernet cable. Um, you'd see a little bit of wireless creeping in, and so there is a there used to be a big split between 80% of the, the local LAN switching infrastructure would be dedicated wired infrastructure, and maybe 20%, if you were lucky, was uh, was wireless. And we're slowly starting to see that shift, you know, the pendulum going from that far one side all the way to the other side, where we're seeing only about 20% of the switches being deployed today, which are actually wired, versus um, versus 80% wireless. Most of the RFPs that we're seeing at the moment. There's a massive sw switch to, towards unified access and enabling people to connect with wireless devices, being able to move around the offices, saving companies a huge amount of money in cabling and maintaining that infrastructure, et cetera, going forward. Now, 
in order for that flip to occur, uh, there is actually some fundamental infrastructure that needs to be in place. And so if we're looking at basic switching infrastructure, um, you know, three of the key things that you need there is power over Ethernet, so in order to actually provide power capabilities to that wireless access point. Um, the second thing that we're seeing is with a switch from 802.11n to 802.11ac, and now with Wave 2 coming on, um, we're actually seeing that the bandwidth supported on these access points are phenomenal. You know, so you can actually support a good number of users. Um, but that also means that the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure that connects these wireless access points um, needs to be able to cope with the bandwidth. You know, so you need to have access ports on the switches that are 1 gig Ethernet capable. And, uh, and then as you have all of these access points aggregating on a switch, you also need to have the capacity to actually connect all of those um, uh, interconnected wireless access points into your core network. You know, so that's really where the 10 gig and 40 gig um, uplinks come in um, so that more users can actually uh, access this infrastructure at the same time. You know, so I think what we'll see is as users start switching to, uh, sorry, as clients start adapting to 802.11ac, we'll also start seeing an impact on their environments on uh, the ability of the older environments to actually support that higher bandwidth and higher throughput, et cetera. So what, we, um, what we're seeing is in the network parameter report that you know, clients are generally refreshing their networks. Um, the interesting thing is that they're not always refreshing uh, due to architecture's sake. They're really refreshing on the side of, uh, you know, if you look at the, the life cycle buckets, aging, uh, sorry, current aging and obsolete, you know, where current devices are really the devices that, are, that, that we can currently buy from the vendor, that the vendor is actively selling and supporting. Um, aging devices, you know, those would be the devices that are typically not for sale anymore, but the vendors are still supporting them, they're releasing software patches, etc. And obsolete devices would be the devices that the vendor is no longer supporting. And um, we have a lot of clients that actually run that type of equipment as well. But what we're seeing is that the refresh is really occurring on the obsolete device side, um, not necessarily in the, in the aging devices, and which really means that clients are refreshing, but they're only refreshing where it's absolutely necessary. Um, but when they are refreshing, we're seeing that they, in the access switching side, they're generally refreshing with devices that are power over Ethernet capable, that have 10 gig uplinks, that are supporting 1 gig um, access ports, etc., in order to support a mobile strategy. So I think um, you know, it's interesting because um, if you look at the, the changes from last year to this year's barometer report, um, we are seeing a slight move uh, you know, where, where there are definitely more power over Ethernet ports being deployed, there are definitely more 10 gig uplinks being deployed, etc. But it's not really a fundamental shift yet. It's really a piecemeal approach to, to refreshing. Um, you know, so the, the barometer report, uh, you know, just painting a little bit more information on this, this is really data that we're aggregating from our technology lifecycle management assessments. Um, and this was you know, data that we gathered during the year. Um, and uh, you know, throughout this whole process in analyzing the data for this year, um, there are really four sort of domains that we looked at. The one was the life cycle status of the devices. The, the other was really around um, you know, root causes of incidents on this networking equipment. Uh, we looked at security and, and then lastly also the architecture trends as it relates to mobility and the Internet of Things, etc. Now as part of that analysis, we also had a look at the, um, the wireless access points that we actually discovered during, during the year. And what was interesting is that, um, that very few of the wireless access points actually supported uh, 802.11n even, right? So, um, so the majority of the access points out there, 74% of them, uh, are still 802.11g and older, um, you know, which really means that a lot of companies with uh, wireless infrastructure is not really capable to support a mobile strategy, a solid mobile strategy. They are not able to run proper communications infrastructure over their world, mobile networks, etc. Um, you know, and uh, I think that's going to be interesting because it could be that clients are just um, generally waiting for the newer technology to come out before they start adopting. Um, but I think uh, I think it's safe to say that some clients might be taking a wait and see approach to see how this uh, landscape really uh, settles before they're actually buying into a vendor strategy or a specific technology, etc. Um, 
in addition to this, we really saw, you know, as it relates to Internet of Things, which we'll touch on in a minute, we also saw that companies in general uh, are running IP version 6 in their networks already. So on average in the data centers, we're typically looking at between 4 and 9% of the traffic, which is IP version 6 already. But the fundamental underlying infrastructure doesn't really support it. And so what we found was that by far, the majority of the devices are still not IP version 6 capable. Um, whereas many of those devices, so 46% out of the devices that aren't capable, really just require a software upgrade. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, Nadim, as it relates to, um, to IP version 6 and Internet of Things, um, do you think that clients are, are really ready to, uh, you know, to go down an Internet of Things uh, strategy? How prepared do you think they are? Um, what should they look into uh, to ready in, in order to, to prepare for that? Uh, sure. Um, well, while not strictly an arch architectural trend like uh, mobility, um, the Internet of Things is also predicted to have huge influence on corporate infrastructure. And, um, and the Internet of Things will see an increasing number of uh, increasing number and a variety of uh, business enabling technologies. They're interconnecting with uh, via networks. Um, in a nutshell, non-human objects uh, just are able to gather data from their environment, interact with one another, make intelligent decisions, all without human intervention. So. Um, just that evolution in networking is projected to have many business benefits uh, from generating some of the useful big data that will enable better decision making. We touched on that a bit earlier, um, to increasing visibility and control of the systems and processes, and that's all going to reduce management time and costs. However, the challenge is that in the rise of the, of the number of interconnected devices, that's going to lead to a scarcity and eventually unavailability of our current IP, or IP, <laughs> IP version 4. Uh, addresses. Uh, so that's going to certainly compel organizations to adopt the new IPv6 standard. Um, and that is the most recent version of the IP protocol, the internet protocol. Um, it's going to provide identification and location of systems for devices on networks and of course route traffic across the internet. So IPv6 is intended to replace IPv4. Um, and you, as you mentioned, Andre, uh, our results show that only 21% of the devices currently support IPv6. Um, the largest proportion of those devices, about almost half, can actually be switched to IPv6 through a simple software upgrade, but they currently remain as is. So that, that not only indicates to us a lack of planning or, or preparation for Internet of Things, um, but honestly also lacks a basic uh, network maintenance strategy as well. Yeah, no, I think... I think the team, and I think you know, organisationally, I, th I think this is probably the you know I mentioned before the, the digital dilemma statement that we talk of. Um, you know, 66% of CIOs are even stating that you know stating that they're, they're not ready for the Internet of Things, they're not ready for the the, the digital revolution that they're the, that they can all see in their organisations. You know, they're they're carrying a, a huge amount of risk in their business right now. Um, you know, if we if we take the just go back to the the buying centre point I made before. You know, if 50% if of the buying center power resides in the line of business, I can, I can promise you that the line of business, the last thing they're thinking of right now is the core stability of the network. They're, they're, they're in application mode. 50% so of IT budgets are lined up into applications because applications drive business outcomes, right? Um, that, that's what they see. They see business outcomes. And, what, you know, my, my fear, honestly, with organizations right now is that there's a lot of um, unconscious movement in, in, right now in organizations where this is being shifted, a shadow IT is being created, um, but at the same time, huge pressure is being put on that core IT resource, which, which is, is diminishing in, in size. You know? it, it seems to me as if there's a, and, and by the way, then more and more mature, so it's, it's like saying also more and more mature users because even the line of business, you know, the line of business is going to be just by its very nature is going to be um, out of date compared to the, the next generation user. So, so I really do see a perfect storm brewing here for organizations. And you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that, you know, when, I, when I'm meeting CIOs, the biggest thing I, I say is that you know, it's, it's find out how you can diminish your, the rigidity in your environment. Yeah? Whether it be the network, the application layer, um, or, or any other, or, or your, your your overall I and O strategy, your, your infrastructure and operation strategy, how do you defer the risks risk uh, profile that you have? You know, how do you ensure that the, the, the skills that you have within your organization 
organization don't become obsolete. And I think I think that's the big shift we're seeing organizationally right now, which is the, the huge shift now from IT being a, a, a delivery and innovation center to becoming a measure, measure of business outcomes. And I think that's where IPv6 comes in, you know, gives that flexibility for organizations. But you know, the, the fear is that, that how ready organizations are due to the, um, if you like, the, the, the shackles around their neck through uh, sunken investments in their current state. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much for joining me today, for hanging out together. And uh, we're coming to the end of our hangout. But before we go, um, Ian and Nadim, do you have any recommendations to organizations you know, as they actually move forward with their mobility plans, Internet of Things strategies, and their user-centric plans? Uh, do you have any recommendations that we could leave uh, organizations with today? Yeah, uh, Ian, if you don't mind me starting, um, I would sure. just uh, press up, preface my thoughts with uh, this and, and just say that it's clear from um, the results of this year's Brown Report, the organizations approach mobility more reactively uh, than strategically. Um, just by focusing um, more on the access layer of the infrastructure, possibly just to accommodate the influx of new smartphones and laptops and tablets into the organization. But again, um, I think as um, we both, uh, as the three of us have mentioned, the rest of the infrastructure is lagging behind. Um, we talked a little bit about the um, IPv6 adoption kind of across the networks is going a little slow, um, even though it requires some simple software upgrade. Um, I think there's just a um, lack of basic network exposure. Um, um, I'm sorry, at least of, of network management that's exposing organizations to unnecessary risk. So, I mean, our recommendation is preparing the infrastructure for enterprise mobility, Internet of Things. Um, all that should be really part of a coherent network architecture strategy. Um, it shouldn't be handled reactively like it's currently um, being done. Um, approached in a much more planned and organized way um, by creating and implementing a comprehensive roadmap uh, for development. The second thing I'd say is um, establishing a platform to manage and provision securely and safely the appropriate uh, system services, applications, uh, and data to employees. That's all that and all the com complexity that that entails, um, and, and also includes it within the shift to user centric computing involves. Um, that's all necessary to manage all that complexity. So, uh, when it comes to applications, we need to maintain corporate compliance for applications. Uh, if this happens, necessary to it really abstract the user from the device, abstract the applications from the OS. Um, and going forward, the most cost-effective model will be micro apps, uh, and this is where the mainstream adoption is going to occur. Uh, in terms of data, when we move from PC-centric to user-centric model, um, it's vital that users can access their data regardless of the device or uh, device they're using or the location that they're at. Um, so organizations really got to help their users work seamlessly across devices. Um, this obviously has security implications. Um, so it's vital that the data is stored securely in a neutral space um, just so that it's abstracted again from the operating system. And then there's identity management across applications and services, integration via API into legacy of third-party systems, uh, user interfaces. Uh, the complexity is, is really too great to tackle separately in a, in a silo of fashion as it's done today. So really a platform and a suite of services that really allows organizations to deliver this user-centric model is critical. I don't know if Ian, if you want to add something. Yeah, look, I, th I think, you know, from a, you know, I guess probably a quite a broad level, you know, the, the, the reality is right now the world has changed. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the, the, the days of standards uh, policy, you know, uh, rigid policies, etc. You know, it reminds me, when, when, I, when I still hear this, it reminds me of a guy, you know, stood there with an umbrella up. I'm waiting for a tidal wave to hit. You know, it's it really is that kind of that kind of uh, model where you just you cannot stop the force of the user right now. You know, there is no doubt about it. So it's so it's how you plan for that. And you know, to go, but I think just to reiterate, you know, that to me, step one for a CIO is is get ready to optimize and de-risk your position as quickly as possible. Yeah, that 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 is you know, I, I I'm sure it's CIO, CIO 101 right now. You know, how do you how do you reduce the unnecessary cost? You know, it seems, you know, if you look at a communications tower and expenditure in there right now, you know, over 55% of expenditure is on carriage. You know, carriage. You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a commodity at the best of times. Yeah, so 55% so of your, your budget is being spent in commodity. Okay, only, in fact, only 12% of it is spent on technology. How are you, how are you, you know, everything else is spent on operations. So, so almost, you know, it seems a strange thing for dimension data to say, forget about technology as a strategic focus for you right now. 
optimize what you you have drive down the cost of ino drive down the, the cost of carriage and drive down the risk profile of both yeah you do not tie yourself into long term networks do the network contracts de-risk the position from your infrastructure de-risk your position from the operational side and then look at secondly the big one is is how do you foresee the user trends yeah so how do you trends you know work on your analytical tools have the platforms to manage your your mobile strategy again de-risk yourself from the change that will happen in that that area and the third thing is make yourself relevant to the line of business. See, you, see yourself as, a, as an enabler, not a blocker. You know, turn the perfect storm that you've got in mode one into the day in the sun over in mode two. You know, um, work with the line of business. Show the relevance that IT can bring to drive down their cost, drive up their efficiency, drive up their security, and drive up the effectiveness of their tools. And we're seeing a big shift in organizations now moving towards um, you know, a huge part of the IT um, headcount actually being focused in client services, so internal client services rather than service delivery. So, so I think when you link all of those things together, you start seeing a fundamental shift in the way it, IT's role, but it, but absolutely a role um, that would see a far more sustainable future for for the IT organisation in what is a, a, a time monumental change. Thanks for that, Ian and, and Nadine. So this absolutely makes sense. And just getting back to the network. Uh, you know, that fundamentally ties all of these dots together. Um, I think, you know, if we need to look at the network and the role that it plays within all of this, there are already four recommendations or four steps that I would really like to, um, to highlight today uh, to actually help organizations to raise their maturity level and, and ultimately also their uh, operational support environments and their ability to support uh, the business going forward. Um, and I think if we look at those four steps, the first is really achieving visibility on, on what you have. You know, what do you have in the network? What is actually supported by the network? Uh, what is connected to all of these devices? You know, have that well-made, accurate inventory. Uh, secondly, standardize on technology. Um, as soon as you've actually started standardizing on technologies throughout the, the network environment, you can also start standardizing on the configurations. As soon as you start standardizing on the configurations, it really puts you in an ideal position to start automating a lot of the day-to-day -day management tasks, which is the third thing that I really want to mention. Um, you know, and this could be uh, around uh, software-defined networking technologies, around just simple day-to-day -day management tasks, reducing operational expenses, etc. And then lastly, you know, monitoring these devices closely. This is something that we see in day in and out. Organizations spend a fortune on monitoring nobody's watching it, nobody's reacting to alarms going off, um, or it's not being deployed properly. So really, you know, monitor the devices closely, either through a proper deployed in our system or uh, by using um, a, a third party to do that. Um, and this really reduces the time, and we showed in the network parameter re report this year as well, it reduces the time that it takes to troubleshoot uh, any outages, and it also thereby reduces the, um, the outage window that will occur when these devices do go down. So gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. And um, it was good. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, guys.